morning, Bookless Classroom. I am here making sure everything's on the way it's supposed to be. Happy Halloween. We are on day 90. It's October 31st, 2023. It is Halloween. We are on day 90 of our classroom. Oh, somebody enjoys that. We are here in our bookless classroom. I really do not have our... Mi familia. I really do not have my uh, my um, chalkboard up to date, but did I say Halloween? So that is awesome. Uh, even though it was Monday's class, we did a special Monday's class. Uh, for, what did we do on Monday? What do we do? Halloween stuff. Halloween stuff, duh. And I did a, I did a special shorts on these little covers. So I have a little, here, this is my, uh, obviously, peace sign. Here's my little spaceship. So these are covers for my lens. So look at my shorts videos out there. Whoop. And you will see how to, see what I did with these where I got these from and what I did with them. No big, it's not a big deal. I'll give you a hint. From a milk carton. More than a hint. Okay. I have got little sneezy things because I picked these up from the basement. So hold on, let me get my Kleenex. And I have my coffee. And I have a plethora of hats, but I think I'm going to stick with this one for reconstruction. I picked this one out. I did think we were talking about witch burning. I have plenty of witchy poo hats, but this one is a little bit more for reconstruction. I was thinking. It's the 1930s. Mm. But we're making it work. I don't have a costume for everything. What do you think? I'm a hundred. I've been collecting these since I was a hundred. No, it's been a while since we have been here because we did some readings. We did a deep dive on some readings from Norton's Anthology of American Literature, Bartolome de las Casas and Thomas Harriet. Thomas Harriet was a mathematician scientist that sort of give, it gave us, he gave us a very um, descriptive and sterile look at the situation. And in my mind gave us the, the sort of springboard that led us to believe um, that the Indians were not warriors like um, and killers until they were forced to take on the Christian religion. And that's just the way it is. I mean, you know, who, where, what is with all the big hush hush, right? What's with all the big hush hush? This is what happened. That's what happened. The Christians came in and they decimated indigenous people. And then wondered why they couldn't get people to believe in their God. I don't know what's going on here. We really do need to do a vocab dive is what we need to do eventually. But let's go on to chapter three now. Chapter three, Congress takes a stand. Oh, let's see who these mealy mouth, vanilla, lukewarm, potato soup kind of guys are. I will say having friends there to support and stand with me did make me feel better about the situation. Why was there so much friction between the U.S. Congress and President Johnson? So that, right here, sorry about that. So that looks like that is where, right here, we are going to take off from. I got to see why, why is this? Ugh. Here, here we go. No. Down this way. In. Oh my gosh, see what I'm saying? 
Here we go. Okay. You don't even know how difficult that is. Oh my gosh, I gotta sneeze. Oh, big sneeze. Hold on. I said, I do think it's from all these costumes here. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, I guess it's important to remember that not everyone shares the same beliefs, but I was surrounded by people who love and support me, people who are of the same mind and heart. That's true. And with support like that, things will change for the better more and more. Hey, Mrs. T, Sharon, would you both like the usual today? Sounds good, Mark. Yes, please. So there we have a little cute cartoon there. I'm going to read here. Many Republican members of Congress disagreed with how President Johnson was managing Reconstruction. They wanted to see more support for African Americans. This conflict in ideals set the stage for fiery clashes in Washington, D.C. The 39th Congress reconvened on December 4, 1865, as the clerk of the House of Representatives called the roll. Each representative responded. Then the clerk reached the name of one of the newly elected representatives from the South and skipped right over it. Shouts of protest erupted from the seats where Southern lawmakers sat, but the clerk kept reading the name, skipping over every single representative from the former Confederacy. This was no error. This was the Republicans' plan. Wow. Well, that does make a statement now, doesn't it? When the clerk reached the end of the roll call, a lawmaker from Tennessee demanded to speak, but Congressman Thaddeus Stevens said he refused to yield the floor to any gentleman who does not belong to this body. The House had the sole power to seat new members. If someone's name was not read in roll call, that person was not technically a member of Congress and could not vote on laws. Wow. 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 It's what's crazy really is that just the profound disagreement on the topic with the, the such powerful, powerful people. They already said it, the, pre, the, the president, Johnson, the president versus Congress. 
Regardless of President Johnson's lenient reconstruction plan, Republican congressmen had no intention of allowing leaders of the former Confederacy to rise to power again. Now that Congress was back in session, the House and Senate created a joint committee to investigate conditions in the South. They refused to allow the president to continue to control Reconstruction by himself. The power struggle between the executive and legislative branches had begun, and the fate of millions of freed people hung in the balance. Divisions within Congress Republicans controlled the 39th Congress, but they did not all agree on how to carry out Reconstruction. While they all believed freed people should have basic rights, they disagreed on what those rights were and what responsibility the federal government had in safeguarding those rights. The lawmakers known as the Radical Republicans believed the moment had come for a second American Revolution. Led by Pennsylvania Representative Thaddeus Stevens in the House of and Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner in the Senate, the radicals saw Reconstruction as a chance to reshape the United States so everyone was equal. They wanted to grant universal suffrage, meaning all citizens could vote. Also, the radicals wanted to temporarily treat the former Confederacy as conquered territory with no rights rather than as states. Article 4 of the Constitution gave Congress the authority to govern conquered land. Makes sense to me, doesn't it? I mean, we we have seen clearly no, no, I guess the right word isn't punishment, right? Because if you say punishment, then you're just like, well, yeah, if you're going to punish them, no wonder it's they don't want to work with you, right? There has to be consequences, right? Otherwise, what? Otherwise, we've got what we've got right now. The Great Commoner. Thaddeus Stevens was known as the Great Commoner. In September 1865, Stevens gave a speech in which he pointed out that the 70,000 wealthiest former slave owners owned 394 million acres of land, which could be redistributed as 40 acres each to 1 million freedmen. The government would have land left over to sell to pay off war debts. When asked how the loss of land would affect the wealthy 70,000, Stevens said that for all, the, all he cared, those proud, bloated, and defiant rebels could go into exile. Thaddeus Stevens, between 1860 and 1875. The credit here goes to... Matthew Brady and Levin Corbin Hannity. Hannity and Combs? What's up with that? A stern looking man. Let's see if we've got a. We're going to see if we've got a speech. Got to get off my bum in order to get the book. John Oliver, I don't think you're you got that accent. I'm just saying, I recognize you from the past, and it ain't good for you. Thaddeus Stevens. Did we have one from um, Sumner? I don't think so. But we didn't hear anything about Sumner's speech. We heard about his beating. So no Sumner. And no Thaddeus Stevens either. So, didn't make the cut, which is, which is kind of too bad. Although I likely could find it, right? Library of Congress. So, the great commoner. Boy, he's stern looking.
again, I'm just look, I'm looking at these stern faces. President Andrew Johnson. Who's the gentleman down here? And Andrew Johnson. The gentleman there is Senator Trumbull between 1870 and 1880. I don't know why we have people who even look like this running our country. I mean, I hate to be that way. But there are things to say about little snake eyes, slithering bodies, tongues that do this. I'm just saying. I'm not saying they had that. I don't, I, how would I know? The radicals believe they should control Reconstruction, not President Johnson. However, most congressional Republicans were moderates and viewed Reconstruction differently. Moderates considered Reconstruction a practical problem to be settled quickly. While some support, supported giving black men the right to vote, they didn't speak out. They also agreed with President Johnson that because secession was illegal the southern states had never really left the union by this reasoning the states still had the powers given to them under the constitution oh how convenient if it's illegal shouldn't breaking the law be punishable as soon as the 39th congress opened moderate republican reject as soon as the 39th Congress opened, moderate Republicans rejected the proposal of the radical Republicans and seized leadership of Congress. Senator John Sherman said the country had already suffered too much from ultraists and wranglers, in other words, people with extreme views. Still, moderates were as alarmed as radicals about reports of violence, freed people, uh, violence against freed people, the passage of black codes, and the election of former Confederates. President Johnson's Reconstruction policies needed to be tweaked. 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 Tweaked with a big cannon. Senator Lindman Trumbull met with Johnson here. So here's Senator Lindman Trumbull. Let's see what that bright-looking, cheerful face has to say to this bright-looking, cheerful face over here. Over here, over here. Senator Lindman Trumbull met with Johnson at the end of December 1865 to explain the concerns of Congress. He left the meeting convinced that the president wishes no issue with Congress, and if our friends, the radicals, would be reasonable, we would all get along harmoniously. As 1865 ended, moderates hoped Reconstruction would go smoothly. Do you think maybe they were lying about how smooth this was going to go? Moderate reforms. Moderate Republicans believe two adjustments would fix problems that stemmed from President Johnson's Reconstruction policies. They wanted to extend the Freedmen Bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau and pass a civil rights bill. First, they tackled the Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was authorized to operate only one year beyond the end of the Civil War, and time was almost up. The agency was expensive to operate, but Republican lawmakers believed it did vital work. Also, Congress was still receiving alarming reports about violence against freed people. Moderates wanted to extend the life of the Bureau and give it more power. Senator Trumbull drafted the new Freedmen's Bureau bill and introduced it on January 5th, 1866. The legislation, the legislation would extend the life of the Bureau until Congress abolished it and would authorize the president to reserve 3 million acres of unoccupied public land to be rented to freed people. The bill also stated that anyone who deprived citizens of their right could be fined or jailed. After a three-week debate, the bill passed the Senate and was sent to the House where it was expected to pass. Then Senator Trumbull got to work on a civil rights bill. He proposed, his proposal defined all people born in the United States except Native, Native Americans living on tribal lands as citizens and declared that regardless of race, all citizens must receive full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property. Yeah. 
View an anti-Freedmen's Bureau pamphlet on the Library of Congress website. What methods does this pamphlet use to convince voters that the Freedmen's Bureau is not a good agency? Does this pamphlet seem racist to you? Why or why not? Well, let's see if we can't find it. Climber Freed Men's Bureau. Can I see it? I bet you do. I bet you do. Here it is at the Library of Congress. Let's see here. The Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man, twice vetoed by the president and made a lawy by Congress, support Congress and you support the Negro, you, you support the Negro, sustain the president and you protect the white man. Well, how about that? So very clearly not a president For all the people. Oh my gosh. Do you see what we saw? Now, of course, that was before my time, but it's not as if. I haven't seen things like that. So that is what they portrayed and how often, so that even today, right? How is it that our immigrants are seen as being lazy? How is it that our black slaves are always reported as being idle? An agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man, twice vetoed by the president and made a law by Congress. Support Congress and you support the Negro. Sustain the president and you protect the white man. The, um, the copy obviously up at the top there was incorrect. Lawy, who, who typed that? I mean, that's horrible. And then here we've got a little bit about the item. The Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man twice. Be oh, well, that's a title. One in a series of racist posters attacking radical Republicans on the issue of black suffrage. I'm sorry, I thought you had that in the view. You do not. Issued during the Pennsylvania gubernatorial election of 1865. See also the Constitutional Amendment number 1866-5. The series advocates the election of Heister Clymer, who ran for governor on a white supremacy platform, supporting President Andrew Johnson's reconstruction policies. In this poster, a black man lounges idly in the foreground as one, and, and oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize... I didn't recognize the black man because that looks like an animal to me. 
I didn't recognize. So, so, oh, thank you for telling me that there is a black man in the foreground because who would recognize that creature sitting there as a man? Dear Jesus. Lounges idly in the foreground as one white man plows his field and another chops wood. Accompanying labels are, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat thy bread. And the white man must work to keep his children and pay his taxes. The black man wonders, where is the use for me to work as long as de make death's appropriations? Above in a cloud is an image of Freedmen's Bureau Negro Estimate of, free, free, of Freedom. The bureau is pictured as a large do, domed building resembling the U.S. Capitol and, and is inscribed Freedom and No Work. Its columns and walls are labeled candy, rum, gin, whiskey, sugar plums, indolence, white women, apathy, white sugar, idleness, fish balls, clams, stews, and pies. At right is a table giving figures for the funds appropriated by Congress to support the Bureau and information on the inequality of the bounties received by black and white veterans of the Civil War. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, Heister Climber. Heister Climber! What does that sound like? Jeez, what does that sound like? Sounds like eugenics coming to the surface is exactly what it sounds like. Hi, my climbing. Heister Climber. Heister Climber. Eugenics coming right to the surface. White supremacy right to the surface. Eugenics. Here is the beginning, folks. This is the beginning. Unbelievable. So he started the so he started the Freedmen's Bureau is what it sounds like. Heister Climber. It is his Freedmen's Bureau. Let's look up that SOB and his offspring. Moderate Republicans wanted free people to be able to compete as free laborers in the South, something the black codes were blocking. To enforce this law, the bill empowered federal district attorneys, federal marshals, and Freedmen's Bureau officials to sue anyone, including logical and state, including local and state officials who violated free people's rights. The Civil Rights Bill that was introduced tried to define in legal terms what freedom meant in practical terms. The bill was not designed to protect just Southern black people. Discriminatory laws in the North, and there were many, would also be invalidated. The bill passed both the House and the Senate by March 15, 1866, and was sent to the president to sign. Reconstruct. The Freedmen's Bureau dispensed more than 13 million food rations throughout the South, including 4 million rations to poor whites. See... I don't understand. Do you understand? I don't. Is the Freedmen's Bureau good or is it not good? I don't understand. The Freedmen's Bureau dispensed more than 13 million food rations throughout the South. And so maybe maybe what it is is Climbers, Climbers Freedmen's Bureau. Okay, I get it. I'm sorry. I do get it. Although I don't understand. I do understand, actually, why they would use the same lingo. That is confusing, right? Because that's what they're, they're calling this, aren't they? Freedmen's Bureau. But they're calling this Climbers Freedmen's Bureau.
Well, the Freedmen's Bureau, I guess, okay, is really, a, yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't getting it necessarily. I don't know why. Um, because it sounds like, because they called it Climbers Freedmen's Bureau. And it's not a Freedmen's Bureau. It's an anti-Freedmen's Bureau. But it's pictured like the state capitol here. So the Bureau, the, the Freedmen's Bureau is looking like government, right? To free people. Okay. All right. I hope you find this interesting. I do. I'm not reading it in the most interesting way. I'm going to have to get it from the words. African Americans call for reforms. While the Freedmen's Bureau bill sat on the president's desk and Congress crafted the Civil Rights Bill, black Americans seized the opportunity to push for more. They knew true equality required the power to vote. In January 1866, delegates from 13 states gathered for the National Convention of Colored Men in Washington, D.C. After much discussion, attendees decided to press the federal government to guarantee equal rights for all American citizens, irrespective of race or color, including the right to vote. The convention statement mentions nothing about the right of women to vote, as female suffrage was not the primary concern. Of course! Oh, you can't see my spider. I need to have my spider up a little bit more. The convention statement, let's see. The convention statement mentions nothing about the women's right to it as a woman's female suffrage was not the primary concern. The convention selected five representatives to meet with President Johnson to state their case. When the delegation entered the Oval Office on February 7th, 1866, President Johnson was scowling like this. And then they snapped a picture. He looks, I can't stop staring at him. He looks a lot like my uncle. My uncle Al. He does. But who knows? I was wondering if he's like Hitler's son or something. I don't even know. Why would I? <laughs> this was not a good look. No, no, this was not a good sign. <laughs> George Downing, a successful hotel owner, asked the African-American be fully enfranchised throughout the land. Former slave and speaker Frederick Douglass said that since black people paid taxes and fought for the country, they would like to share in the privilege of citizenship as well as its burdens. Douglass told the president that if given the vote, freedmen could ally the poor Southern whites to dismantle the power of the wealthy plantation owners. President Johnson was having none of it. And that, what the heck? What the heck did Lincoln have Johnson as a VP? No comprendo. No comprendo. This was just a whole um, maneuvering maneuver. Maneuvering practice. This is just a, just a, do, 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 do. what do you call it? I don't even know. Taps, din, din, din. Marching in line. Soldiers. Creating soldiers. What a bunch of BS. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Johnson, you're out. Johnson went on a long rant. Yeah, it looks like you would. It looks like that's all you got. A lot of words and no sense. Nonsense. You're nonsense, Johnson. Andrew Johnson. Whose kid was named after him? Poor you. 
Even though he had once owned slaves, the president claimed he had been a friend of the colored man all his life. Johnson then engaged in, a per in personal attacks. He said he did not like people who could talk about abstract ideas of liberty who never periled life, liberty, or property. This comment was cruelly ironic because Frederick Douglass had been beaten by a former slave owner and his son, Louis, who was also present, had been severely wounded in the Civil War. So just a lot of BS in the rant, sounds like to me. Johnson told the delegation that he did not support black suffrage. Oh, surprise, what? Maine Senator Lott M. Morrill said, this species of legislation is absolutely revolutionary, but are we not the are we not in the midst of a revolution? Hmm. Yeah, it would be revolutionary. It sure would be. Reconstruct. The president told his secretary, those damn sons of bitches thought they had me in a trap. I know that damn Douglas. He's just like any N-word and would sooner cut a man's throat than not. What can you learn about Johnson's character from this statement? He hates black people. <laughs> Sounds like Conway. Kanye West. Conway. Conway Twitty. Conway Twitter said, sounds like him. He made that comment about George Bush. George Bush doesn't like black people. And Andrew Johnson doesn't like black people. Those damn sons of bitches thought they had me in a trap. I know that damn Douglas. He's just like any N-word. And would sooner cut a man's throat than not. And would sooner cut a man's throat. Because that's what he's saying. We have to stop on that. And that's why I reread it. We have to stop on that. So my inclination, not me, Dr. Farovich, but here, our, the president, Andrew Johnson's inclination is to believe that black men would just as soon cut your throat. That's their first inclination. And that's what Johnson is believing about black men. They would just as soon cut your throat as anything else. How? And, and then the picture there of the idleness and the laziness and then the insinuation that this idleness brings about bad people. Bad people who want something for nothing. You mean like all those white people in power? All those white men in power, not white people. All those white men in power wanting, wanting something for nothing? Oh, they're plowing their fields. Bullshit, they were plowing their fields. Bullshit. Just like that guy over there who did two sweeps with a giant vacuum for leaves. So he didn't mow. He vacuumed up two sweeps and dumped him. That's how I know he did it. It was so brazen. It was the, the criminality is so brazen that you don't even do the whole property and make it look like you were cleaning up the property. What you look like you did was you did enough to fill up your great big giant vacuum and they dumped him on my property. The same guy who used the leaf blower during my husband's funeral dumped I had everything. I, I spent three days cleaning everything up. I, I had to bag. I have over five bags that I had to bag after he dumped them all over my property that I just cleaned of leaves. You know why? Because they just like to get those sons of bitches working in front of their eyeballs. That's what they're trying to do. Get us little bitches working in front of their eyeballs. That's what they want. Well, those fat guys are pretending to plow their field. He hired somebody to do that, by the way. That wasn't him. He hired somebody to do that. So, paying people to do criminal things in the Lake Sherwood community here in Commerce Township, Michigan, with our president of the association, who is clearly a criminal as well because he supports criminals. If you support criminals, what you are is aiding, abetting, and crimes. You are an accomplice. Steve Bible. 
Ugh. And all you other people on the board are too. Because I've told you about all this criminal behavior and you've done nothing. Sounds like we're back here in slavery. Well, are you a woman? Oh, you're a woman of color? Oh, oh, pew, pew. two shots against you. Pew, pew. Pew, pew. I'm this trusty spider, you SOBs. Pew, pew. At the moment Frederick Douglass interrupted, he reminded the president that black people were the majority in South Carolina and Mississippi. The president stood up. The meeting was over. These delegates refused to give up. The men wrote an open letter to the published, to be published in the Washington Chronicle. They said Johnson's views were entirely unsound and prejudicial, and they believed it was their duty to expose and as far as may be in our power, arrest Johnson's dangerous influence. The president seethed. Sounds like current times, doesn't it? What happens next? Oh my gosh. Could it tell us about the future? I'm going to read here. We as in me. You can read along, then it would be a we. In an open letter to President Johnson, a delegation of black men dismantled key arguments Johnson made against black suffrage. The president had told the men that hatred between black people and poor whites would continue even though slavery was abolished. If the president believed that, the men argued, he should immediately grant black people the right to vote so they could protect themselves in such a hostile climate. Peace between races, they wrote, is not to be secured by degrading one race and exalting another, by giving power to one race and withholding it from another, but by maintaining a state of equal justice between all classes. And how about genders, too? We still haven't gotten that down pat. You know what I think? Here's what I think. I've got another nutso idea because i got a nutso hat on. I think that the aliens are men and they came down to planet women and they were like, woo we struck it rich. They are independent. They've got this show on the road. Let us, we're going to teach you something. And they took over our fucking planet. And then they were trying to make us extinct and they're going to make themselves extinct. And you know what we're going to eventually do? Men, all you white men, all the women are eventually just going to go, bam! And you're going to be done. You're going to be so done. Like that fruit fly. You're going to be done. Done for it. Done. Done. And then I'm going to get my AI machine going on me like no other. Mm. You're going to be done. Done. Morse code. That's done. You're done. Where are we? Uh oh. Oh, we got a. We got it. We got it. Okay. We didn't. We didn't have a signal. Signal for a minute. They were like, "Oh my gosh, she's done. Oh, 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 white men again. Oh, 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 oh. yeah." Yeah, we're coming after you. You don't even know. You think you're coming after us? You think you're coming after me? Haven't you heard me come after you? Oh. Veto and override. President Johnson contemplated the Freedmen's Bureau bill that lay on his desk. He had been hearing criticism about the Bureau. When General Grant returned from a tour of the South... He told Johnson some Freedmen's Bureau agents were encouraging former slaves to have unrealistic expectations of what free, freedom might look like. General Dan Sickles, who was overseeing Reconstruction in Louisiana, claimed the Bureau was full of petty tyrants, knaves, and robbers who were doing a great deal of harm. Johnson's cabinet believed the Bureau cost too much. With these complaints in mind, Johnson acted on February 9th. With these complaints that he made up and, and uh, put a magnifying glass on and blew out of proportion, on February 19th, 1866, Pre President Johnson vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau's Bureau Bill. Freedmen's Bureau Bill. 
Now, this is just really upsetting when you think about the power that this one man, what the F are you doing as VP to Lincoln? That's what I don't get. That's what I don't get. Why was he VP to Lincoln? I don't think Lincoln was the upstanding president everyone thinks he was. I don't think he was. And why, do you, why did you look just like my father-in-law? And why did you make everybody believe that you were killed in the theater? Because we all know you weren't. There's no way everyone knew you were going to the theater. And 50% and of the union wanted you dead. You weren't killed. So you men have figured out longevity. Is that what it is? You have longevity figured out. So you guys are the ones who are living for a long time and we're not as women. Is that what it is? 150 years, Sam. Is that what you live till? Solomon. He explained that the bill was unconstitutional, unconstitutional and unnecessary because the situation facing freed people was not so bad. Well, if that's not just an intellectual statement for all, I don't even know what is. Can we quote you on that? Oh, we did. It's in quotes. Not so bad. Thank you for your wise words, President Johnson. I'm holding my Johnson. President, I'm holding my Johnson. Johnson rejected the entire mission of the Bureau. Congress had never provided relief, built schools, or given land to our own people, Johnson wrote. By this, he meant white people. Johnson thought he should control Reconstruction because as president, he was the only official chosen by the people of all the states. Johnson's veto stunned lawmakers, but it takes the, veto, the votes of two-thirds of both houses of, to, of Congress to override a presidential veto, and Republicans could not manage this. They decided to revise the bill and hope Johnson would sign it in the future. Senator Fessenden however, predicted that Johnson will veto every other bill we pass. The Civil Rights Bill was also waiting for Johnson's signature and Republican lawmakers prepared for battle. An Ohio senator wrote to General Sherman, if the president vetoes the Civil Rights Bill, I believe we shall be obliged to draw our swords for a fight and throw away the scabbards. On March 26, Johnson vetoed the bill. Surprise! Johnson claimed the bill gave the federal government too much power. He believed that by helping black people, the law discriminated against whites. The distinction of race and color is made to operate to favor of the colored and against the white race. The war was on. Disrespect. Three days after he vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau bill, Johnson spoke at an event. When he mentioned enemies working to destroy the principles of American government, the crowd urged him to name them. I say Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, Johnson bellowed. I say Mr. Sumner of the Senate is another. Even moderate Republicans were disgusted. Senator William Fessenden wrote that Johnson had broken the faith, betrayed his trust, and must sink into contempt. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, The Gravel Uncle and the Vetoed Babes in the Wood. No, The Cruel Uncle. Sorry. The Cruel Uncle and the Vetoed Babes in the Wood. Okay, so that's got to be Johnson. Because it look, doesn't look like Sumner, kind of, in that picture, I mean. But I get it. Look at how nice, look at how nice this is just laid out. It's just beautiful. It's, it's just full of uh, visuals. It keeps you active, right, in your eyeballs and what you're looking at. It's just, and it, the layout is beautiful to me. I just love it. Nice job, Judy. On April 5th, 1866, history was made when the Senate overrode the president's veto. A headline in one Republican newspaper bluntly revealed the state of, gov of the government. The separation complete. 
A fired Republican Congress took another stab at the Freedmen's Bureau bill and sent a revised bill to Johnson in early summer 1866. On July 16th, he vetoed this version too, but the Senate overrode his veto and the second Freedmen's Bureau bill became law. Despite this pushback, President Johnson refused to yield ground. He kept pardoning Confederate leaders and taking land from freed people. As Johnson and Congress played a played pol political tug of war, freed people faced an ever rising tide of violence. The passing of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Credit goes to Alan Cox here. I'm not sure where that picture is exists. Maybe in Congress. It looks awesome though. Reconstruct. By the spring of 1866, the president had returned 414,652 acres of land to white plants, planters, including 15,000 acres that had been given to freed people. Johnson also replaced Republican officials in the South with conservative Democrats who were uninterested in aiding freed people. How do you do that? How do you secede from the nation and then you get 414,000 acres of land back to you? Congratulations. You killed, are responsible for over 600,000 deaths. Here's your land back for doing that. All of you are pieces of shit up there. And anyone who is any kind of a descendant of the, this ideology or these people, you need to be speaking up and telling us how you've changed things or, or you need to be out, period. Text to, because we don't need those kind of people continuing this kind of, as we see we have. Text to world. Do you think today's U.S. government is as divided as it was during Reconstruction? That's an easy one. That was, that was a softball. That was a little, that was a little fuzzball toss. Is that what that was? Key questions. Who had a greater right to the land in the South? The former slaves who had worked the land or the white planters who had owned the land? Workers or owners? Good question. What kind of reconstruction plan could reconcile both groups' claims peaceably? Peacefully. What kind of reconstruction plan could reconcile both groups' claims peacefully? Do you have a plan in mind? I don't think that I could do better than what they tried to do in their plans, right? Patterns in power. Overriding a presidential veto was very rare in the 19th century. Is it still rare today? How has the, the, the power balance between the executive branch and the legislative branch evolved? Graph the presidential vetoes over the last century and look for patterns. Use the internet to research a number of vetoes and veto overrides for presidents from 1920 to 2020. Records are available on the website of the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Graph the data. Which type of diagram will best represent the following variables? The number of vetoes of each president, the number of veto overrides for each president, the political party of each president. Consider a bar graph, line graph, frequency table, or circle graph. Which tool will best help you look for patterns through time? You can find a graphing tool here. So here's House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, and graphing tool. Analyze the data. What patterns do you see? What is the relationship between presidential vetoes and veto overrides? What factors might explain the patterns you discovered? To investigate more, research a president who vetoed many bills. What was going on domestically and internationally that might explain the opposition this president had to the laws of U.S. Congress, to the laws U.S. Congress wanted to pass? Vocab Lab, which we love over here, right? So Vocab Lab. How do we want it? Or we want it like this. Yeah, there we go. Write down what you think each word means. What root words can you find to help you? What does the context of the word tell you? Well, there is no context here, but executive branch, exile, legislative branch, override, racist, and veto. Compare your definitions with those of your friends or classmates. Did you all come up with the same meanings? Turn to the text and glossary if you need help. I wonder if these are in bold. 
It doesn't look like they are. So it's difficult to find the context is what I'm saying. So Judy, I would put your, your vocab, vocab words in bold so that I can find them in the text so that I knew the context because in the vocab here, there is no context, right? So I'd have to remember the context for that. Okay, that's all that we have for today. We are, oh, no, no, storyboard of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. A storyboard is a tool that directors use to describe key scenes in a film or TV show. It is a graphic organizer made up of a series of panels, each containing an illustrated scene and a written description. Create a storyboard to analyze the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Write questions you have about the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This will help you analyze the purpose and impact of this law. Visit the library and use the internet to investigate answers to your questions. Create a storyboard template with as many panels as you need to analyze the law. You can draw this template yourself or find online or, or find one online. Label and illustrate each panel. Add dialogue, thought bubbles, and other text to explain each panel. Compare your storyboard to those done by your friends or classmates. How is your analysis of the law similar to and different from theirs? To investigate more, my hat is falling off here. To investigate more, do some research and complete a storyboard for the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Compare and contrast the two civil rights laws of the Reconstruction Era. Which law was more effective in securing basic rights for African Americans and why? This is just such a fantastic book. And I'm really, I, I, I have to keep apologizing to you, Judy, because I think that you haven't forgiven me. Because if I know you, you haven't. And I think I do know who you are. And I know you don't forgive easily. <laughs> I do. Um, so I hope you forgive me. We are a little over halfway through our book. Which is really good since we've taken so many breaks. This is Dr. Annette Ferovich. We are here in the bookless classroom. One of our uh, classrooms that we've kept from the very beginning, right? Early birds and bookless classroom we've kept from the very beginning. We have reading room that we've kept from the very beginning. We now have a new name for our Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit classroom, which is engaging a healthy mind, body, spirit. So that's our new name for the same classroom that we are on. Well, we clearly did not update that. That needs to be updated because that's not what we're doing. You know what we're doing for, I, I want to tell you, so we are going to update this. I, I cannot believe I can believe it, but it's not like it's, but of all the best titles that I have, this one is the, is the best title. This is the best concept I'm talking about today. It's not just the best title. It is the best concept I'm talking about today. So, before we go and sign off, we as in me, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. No. Good grief. What is going on here? Oh, that's the problem.
All right, I think I got it. I do not. On in our new titled classroom, Engaging a Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit, we are going to talk about the Godfather Coda as part of our self-improvement series. So I hope if you like the Godfather, as I do, um, I happen to like this one a lot. So we're going to talk about that coming up in about at about 11.45. So... Um, Thanks for joining me. This is Dr. Renee Fairridge. I'm the teacher. Happy Halloween. Thanks for joining me here in the classroom. In the classroom. Let's do that again.